This talk is called Optimizing Brain Health, and, and I am a neurologist at Waikato Hospital in Hamilton. To me, the brain is like a garden. What do you need for a healthy garden? You need seeds. Those are the blueprints for the plants that form the garden. You need an environment. You need water and sunlight to help the plants grow. You need the soil or terrain that also helps the plants grow. Some people, many farmers, would probably say you need some chemicals or besides pesticides to help the, the uh, garden or you know, area of farmland grow. I guess I would say that the environment and the soil or the terrain are the most important factors for a healthy garden. The brain is like a garden. The blueprint is in the genes the genetic code, and those are like the seed, that's like the seeds. The brain grows through experiences, as we've seen with many talks today. Positive experiences, these are the water and sunlight for the brain. The brain also grows through its mitochondria. This is the soil or terrain. Some people, doctors, many of them, would say you need medications to be healthy too. Now, I'm not a farmer, so I'm not sure about the chemicals, but I am a doctor, and I know most of my colleagues would say that medications are important, especially as people get older. I would argue, though, that the experiences in mitochondria are the two key components to brain health. Let's go over experiences first. This is a very loose definition of experience, but it's situations we encounter which shape our genes. The genes in our brain do not change, the genetic code does not really alter. It's how we express it that matters. And William alluded to this earlier when he discussed this hugely important concept of epigenetics. I view epigenetics simply. So this is a wonderful book from the 1800s written by Dumas, the Count of Monte Cristo. It is fixed in time, it cannot change. That's like a genetic code, it's a script. But the same book can be translated into the 1975 version uh, of the film starring Richard Chamberlain or the 2002 version starring Jim Cavazil and Guy Pearce. They're very different versions if you've seen them, and I've seen both several times. So <laughs> the brain is the same. You can have the same genetic code but come out with two drastically different versions of the brain. And it's all about the experiences that brain has through life. It's not all about that, but it's a hugely important part of it. Our brain, before we understand this, we have to understand this that the brain is not like a computer. I still think the concept that you guys were talking about in the last talk is, is <laughs> extremely interesting and valid, but the brain is not like a computer. A computer has inputs and outputs in a central processing unit. The CPU is used to make logic-based computations. The computer must be programmed. They're usually pretty inflexible and they're not very tolerant of failures. Most of all, computers don't understand what they do. I will not get into the semantics of what understanding means, but they don't. Our brain is different. It is a cognitive model of the world. Brains have distributed processing. They process throughout the entire connectivity of the brain. There's no central processing unit, it's distributed. They don't use logic-based rules or computations. They retrieve memories. Brains are self-learning and flexible, and they're very tolerant to failures. If you look at the brain there, the green arrows show how sensory signals from the world go through the eyes and the ears and the skin receptors up to the thalamus, which is in the middle of the brain, and they spread out through the brain to the neocortex, which is that outer edge. Now that neocortex is where a lot of our memories are, probably nearly all of them. Despite the fact that, that there are lots of sensory signals going in and the brain is detecting some of those, a lot of them, there are 10 times as many connections anatomically going back from the cortex to the thalamus, which implies the brain's main role is not to detect sensory signals in the world. This is not so easy to understand. The brain's main job is to create a little inner cognitive model of the world. We all walk around with a model of the world, and this is what makes us so powerful against a computer. We don't compute, we make predictions based on our model. Using the model, we understand the world to an extent, 
And what we see, what we hear, what we feel is not so much the sensory signals from the world represented by the green arrows. It's more about what we're projecting, okay? So it's as Robin said, the brain is a belief-based projection machine. It's not logic-based. We run on beliefs. Ultimately, however, these beliefs are formed by the sensory signals throughout life, the green arrows. The brain builds them into its cognitive model and builds its inner world using our experiences. So our experiences are mostly generated, the blue arrows, but we do have some sensations coming in as part of the experience. Now, when we develop the cognitive model through life, there are four states that the brain switches through, and hopefully you're in the second one for this talk. The first one is relaxed wakefulness. The relaxed wakefulness state is when we're watching TV, we're doing routine things, we're going to work, doing the same things we always do. A big blue arrow, so the brain's generating most of its reality, it's not actually seeing a lot of the actual sensory signals. The second state is the attention state. That's the interactive learning experience state. In that state, the brain is generating a lot of its reality, but there's a big green arrow. You're actually acutely tuned to some aspect of your sensory environment. There are also two sleep states, non-REM sleep, REM sleep. They are for building and modifying the cognitive model that is inside your brain. They, that's when you'd really develop your world, so they're critical. But this is the critical one for obtaining those sensory signals with the big green arrow, that's where most of them come in, and ultimately those become you. So it's really important to have a quality green arrow, good experiences. This leads to the concept of goals. I don't make quite the dichotomized distinction between goals and visions, uh, although I did think that was a very interesting concept and uh, it made me think a bit. I'm gonna think about it more. But I would say that to develop a he healthy cognitive model, we need positive experiences and we need to maximize time in the attention state. We need to minimize time distracting things, self-destructive things, we know what those are. And of course, we do need to focus on sleep. The attention state can be enhanced by focusing on a mix of goals. I would say goals are very targeted versions of values. So again, uh, and I'm a very targeted kind of guy, I need a target to chase or I get lost in the ambiguity. There are A goals. A goals are things a lot of people do. Those are goals you know how to do. You need to buy a house, you need to save this much money, you know how to do it, it's just a matter of work, okay? An example of this in terms of health would be go on a low carb diet for three months to improve your type two diabetes. Then there are the B goals. Things you think you can do, but you're not quite sure. You're not quite sure. A B goal might be going on a keto diet for a year to resolve your type two diabetes and get off your medications. But the really important goals in life are the C goals. I don't think a lot of people have the C goals. They do when they're kids. That's your dreams. And then they let them go. The C goals are the things you can't do. They're impossible. By definition, you can't see the path there. They're castles in the sky. You cannot get there but you go anyways. And as you go, you grow along the way. And as you grow, you might actually get there in the end. But the point of the seagull is not to reach it, which Sophia hit on the head. It's to grow along the way and enjoy the experience with happiness coming out as a byproduct. Chasing happiness is foolish, especially for young people. I, I believe a lot of young people are messing themselves up, chasing happiness when they should be chasing goals and the happiness comes afterwards. An example of a seagull would be fasting a keto diet protocol indefinitely to try and reverse your Alzheimer's. That's a truly wicked seagull. We'll talk more about it that at the end. I see seagulls as life missions or visions. Particularly young people get caught up in their feelings and their emotions, but you need a mission, you need a vision. What gets me up every morning is my mission. It's not how I feel. Sometimes I feel crappy in the morning, I don't care. I don't acknowledge that so much. It's the mission that gets me going. Okay, that's enough neuroscience and psychology because actually that's been done much better than I just did in the previous talks. So I'm gonna talk about the mitochondria more. I call these the soil or the terrain of the brain. Mitochondria are the batteries or powerhouses that provide the majority of energy in our cells and they allow our genes, the genetic code, to flourish. And I was really uh, uh, happy um, to see the uh, first speaker, Julia, talk about mitochondria as that's what you're actually feeding with your food. Uh, that's what you're actually sustaining because the mitochondria sustain the brain. 
Lifestyle disorders. Lifestyle disorders dominate the top 10 causes of death in NZ. If we look at the top 10 causes of NZ, uh, death in NZ today, they can be categorized into four main processes. The number one is atherosclerosis, it's the thickening, hardening of the arteries. It's responsible for nearly all the heart attacks and a large proportion of the strokes. The second process is cancer. We all know what cancer is. The third process is Alzheimer's and similar mental health related disorders. And the fourth process underlying all of this stuff is the metabolic syndrome, the huge elephant in the room. Okay, that's your pre-diabetes, plus or minus type 2 diabetes, your obesity, your hypertension, your abnormal cholesterol profile. That underpins pretty much all of it. And uh, it's, 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 it's to the point where metabolic syndrome is going to be more common than not soon, I think, in, in New Zealand. It's this, uh, this is the true pandemic. Lifestyle disorders, all these disorders, all these disorders share in common uh, mitochondria dysfunction. And I view the mitochondria as the soil or terrain. So you could view this as a weak terrain, okay, weak soil. Just 100 years ago, this chart would have looked very different. These lifestyle disorders did not dominate. Even 50 years ago, it would look different. So what happened? Our dietary lifestyle happened. Metabolism is the sum of all the biochemical reactions in the body, and basically those can be grouped into two things. Anabolism, which is building up the body or the brain, and catabolism, which is breaking it down. And when you catabolize things, you reuse the parts to make new things. Now in our current lifestyle, uh, old lifestyle, sorry, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, which was two to three million years of human evolution, we had balanced anabolism, building up the body because we have frequent meals and bigger faster pe fasting periods and we didn't have sugar everywhere. And also we had increased catabolism and the catabolism was sufficient. We had a lot of fasting in particular. This resulted in healthy mitochondria because the mitochondria did not get exposed to huge amounts of free radicals during the anabolic periods and the mitochondria had tons of time to renew and regenerate during the cata catabolic periods. Okay, so we had balanced metabolism. Anabolism and catabolism were balanced. In a modern dietary lifestyle, which is three meals a day plus snacks, minimal fasting, we have very exaggerated anabolism. Nutrition is not that complicated. It's not as complicated as um, a lot of uh, people would, would probably have you believe, I think. And the catabolism is insufficient. We don't have enough fasting periods. And this results in imbalanced metabolism. Okay, anabolism is greatly favored, catabolism is minimized, it's not enough. So human metabolism, if we had another million years on this modern dietary lifestyle, maybe we could adapt, but we haven't had the time. So this brings the concept of fasting and keto diets and metabolic strategies. I see those two as the most common and best metabolic strategies. Now, um, fasting and keto diets, what they do is they dampen anabolism and enhance catabolism. And this reduces free radical damage throughout your body and allows the mitochondria time to rejuvenate. Now, there's a whole bunch of fancy uh, master regulatory enzymes in those boxes. Don't worry about them. It's not the details that matters. What matters is that when you do a fasting or keto diet strategy, you are enhancing your mitochondria. You're strengthening your terrain, your soil. Your brain is a plant. It's a garden. You're strengthening the soil by doing this. And this can potentially mitigate the lifestyle disorders, I think. The evidence is very uh, fledgling. So basically you're doing, what you're doing is you're uh, improving your mitochondria, including hormesis, which Grant spoke about earlier. So I see the fasting periods and resting periods is key. Those bats, Grant, they probably do a heck of a lot of fasting, sitting upside down and uh, letting their mitochondria rest. And that's uh, really important. So. This is the A game, not the medications. These things induce orchestras of metabolic changes throughout your body. You're changing your body into an entirely different metabolic state aimed at repairing your mitochondria and a bunch of other stuff. And I think these have enormous potential for health. If there was one intervention, in my opinion, that could improve the health of humanity in the West the best, it would be simply to prescribe intermittent fasting protocols. That's it. That's the first and most important thing. So what is fasting? Fasting is a voluntary abstinence from food or drink for at least 12 hours. It generates ketones from your body fat. These are energy molecules, kind of like glucose, but arguably better, and they come from fat, not carbohydrates. Ketones are a superior brain fuel compared with glucose. You can do fasting multiple ways. 
time restricted feeding, so 16 hours of fasting a day, 8 hours of eating, 18 and 6, 23 and 1, or one meal a day, OMAD, that's the one I personally really like. You can do longer fasts, so fasting two out of every, uh, days out of every week, and you can even do prolonged fasts over two days, um, which once you get used to them are not so difficult. The keto diet is simply a high fat, adequate protein, low carb diet. And I see fasting keto as very similar. It also generates ketones. The ketones tend not to come so much from your body fat, but from your dietary fat. Okay, but they're still both producing the ketogenic state. And a keto diet is a natural diet. Many ancestors, I was looking, I was in Canada in August and looking at the indigenous cultures uh, in British Columbia where I grew up. They were, ke they were on a keto diet. They were eating nothing but seafood. That was their staple diet. Now it's very different. Keto diet just removes three things, your sugars, your grains, and your fruits. And it increases natural fats. That's it. And should be based on whole foods, real foods, not processed foods. It can be done many ways as well, like fasting. It's really important to remember that keto diet is not a diet. It's a method. It's a method. It can be carnivore. It can be vegetarian. It can be omnivore. It doesn't matter. All the carnivore vegetarian debates don't matter to an extent. And it can be Mediterranean, Mexican, Indian, any other ethnic cuisine. I've got patients on all kinds of different uh, keto diets. It can be high fiber, low fiber, no fiber. No fiber is fine. Let's talk about applying fasting and keto to Alzheimer's to enhance the terrain, the mitochondria, and see if that improves the Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a very difficult disorder. And with this disorder, you have a whole host of metabolic abnormalities in the neurons in the brain. You have a buildup of abnormal proteins called plaques and tangles in the brain. And these plaques and tangles are thought to produce death of neurons, so neuron loss, and that leads to dementia. Dementia is a symptom, and there are many different causes of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common cause today. So typically it presents with loss of memory and attention. Badness, when you're trying to optimize your good experiences, right? Remember the attention state, very important. For 30 years, we've had this amyloid cascade theory and related theories such as the tau theory, it's basically the same thing, which have regarded Alzheimer's as a disease caused by these abnormal proteins, these plaques and tangles. This is how it goes. This is what I was taught. This is what's still basically taught. You have a normal neuron in the brain. You get these abnormal proteins that build up. The abnormal proteins interfere with the neuron function somehow. And then you get neuron loss and dementia. And there are many inconsistencies, and I'll just mention like three of them. <coughs> the first thing is this, this theory completely ignores the fact that mitochondria are severely damaged and dysfunctional in Alzheimer's. So there's a very weak terrain. Alzheimer's might be one of the weakest terrains that you can get in the brain. The mitochondria are really damaged. And this precedes the plaques and tangles. That alone should perhaps make people think that perhaps the mitochondria are somehow causative. So you get reduced numbers. They're abnormal shapes. Normal mitochondria should be nice and ellipsoid. A lot of these ones are too round or they're too long and skinny. And you get deficient uh, respiratory chain enzymes. This is where all the uh, energy is made. This is a, a very weak terrain. So a normal mitochondria on the left there would, would look like that. You'd have these nice lines. You see the lines in the red circle? Those are the cristae where the energy is made. In Alzheimer's, these mitochondria are a little too circular. Some are long and skinny, not shown on that particular slide. And the cristae are a little bit blurred and amorphous and basically damaged. The second problem with the amyloid cascade theory is that Alzheimer's is quite a specific process. You get the same proteins usually building up in similar areas of the brain, particularly the neocortex and the hippocampus. However, there's many different things that actually have been tied to cause Alzheimer's. It seems to have multiple triggers. The metabolic syndrome was one, aluminum, pesticides, air pollution, head injuries, infections, there's a lot more. How can this be? How can all of these things turn this brain into this brain? Well, they're all known to damage mitochondria. That's my hint. The third thing is this thing called the plaque deposition paradox. The amyloid cascade theory says that plaques and tangles cause Alzheimer's, uh, plaques cause Alzheimer's, and that the plaque load should correlate with the degree of neural loss and dementia. Yet the correlation in reality is quite weak. 
So if you have your neurons there, those little jagged things, and you have a big plaque sitting in the middle of them. On one hand, many non-demented elderly people have large plaque loads, but on the other hand, neurodegeneration and neuron loss can occur in the absence of the plaques. They don't have to be there. This correlation should be strong if the plaques are causing the Alzheimer's, it's not. So there's a different theory of Alzheimer's related to our terrain or mitochondria. This theory says that the neuron mitochondria are exposed to all those various insults I mentioned, and maybe two or three or four of them have to come together to cause this over years and decades damaged mitochondria. When these mitochondria are damaged, these neurons require tons of energy. They're highly performing cells. They require more energy than almost any other cell in the body. And they face an energy shortage. And a gradual rerouting of metabolic priorities is necessary for them to compensate to the energy shortage. And part of that rerouting involves the appearance of these plaques and tangles. They can no longer be removed properly. This theory sees, importantly, the plaques and tangles as a response of Alzheimer's, not a cause. So it's a response to the mitochondria dysfunction, and then you get your neuron loss and dementia. If this is the case, we have a target to treat, a goal, if you will, and that's the mitochondria on the left. We have to try and restore that, and that will help, hopefully, slow down the Alzheimer's process. So fasting and keto diets, in addition to restoring mitochondria, have a lot of other possible benefits in Alzheimer's. Okay, first, they elevate ketones, which is a much better fuel than glucose. Ketones produce more energy per unit oxygen and fewer free radicals than glucose. And they also circumvent brain insulin resistance, which was alluded to earlier. So the brain doesn't use glucose so well in Alzheimer's, but it can use the ketones just as well. Someone with Alzheimer's can use the ketones just as well. They also induce the expression of these neurotrophic factors, which are like the growth hormones for the brain, as was mentioned earlier. They suppress neuroinflammation, which is prevalent in Alzheimer's. They stimulate this process called autophagy. Okay, so fasting keto can help stimulate autophagy, which perhaps may remove some of these proteins if they are at all causative. And again, fasting and keto, the true aim is to restore your mitochondria. It's not about weight loss. It's not about all these other wonderful things, these wonderful side effects. It really is to restore your mitochondria because that's the main game. That's your terrain. And so you create a metabolic advantage for neurons and perhaps you can slow down the Alzheimer's. Has this been tested? Not so much, but we did perform the world's first randomized crossover trial a couple of years ago. So this trial was uh, a randomized trial of a keto diet in people with Alzheimer's. No uh, subjective or mild cognitive impairments in this group. And we just wanted to compare a keto diet with the standard of care, which was a usual diet of the patient with healthy, low-fat recommended eat, um, eating guidelines. And it was not like, uh, you know, processed fats. It was a lot of fruits and, uh, you know, sort of healthy grains and so on that we recommended. We looked at three things because what matters in Alzheimer's are these three things, cognition, function, and quality of life, particularly the last two. People with dementia consistently say that function and quality of life are the two things that matter to me the most. And we used a very powerful randomized crossover design. What does that mean? <clears throat> so we randomized people to keto or usual diet 12 weeks on either diet, we measured them at the start, week six and week 12. And then we had what's called a washout period where they crossed over and each person did the other diet. And then we did the same. That's a very powerful design because you everyone does both interventions. And the paper's there if you want to see it. What did we find? We enrolled 26 people, which is ample for this kind of a design. This is a very powerful design, does not need much uh, in terms of sample size. And uh, I should mention some of the co-authors are in this room today in the audience. And this is what happened. So red is keto, blue is uh, standard of care, usual diet with healthy eating recommendations. The cognition <clears throat> in red stayed about the same, maybe went up a touch and it dropped in the uh, usual diet group. Now that was a trend only, it did not achieve statistical significance, but it was, uh, still a decent trend. Daily function definitely improved. Uh, well, it stayed about the same in the keto group and definitely declined 
in the usual diet group. The, the blue lines there is normal for Alzheimer's. Cognition and function consistently decline over the months, right? This is normal. There's really no surprise there. What's interesting is the red bars are sort of holding the Alzheimer's at bay, it seems, doesn't it? They're sort of staying the same. That was statistically different and clinically meaningful. Clinically meaningful is very important. It means the difference was kind of obvious to people, including doctors. And the third thing we looked at was quality of life that went up in the keto group and it stayed about the same in the usual diet group. And that was also statistically and clinically significant. Those are powerful changes. These last two changes are potentially very important because they're clinically meaningful. They make a difference to the patient. A lot of statistically significant changes in a lot of research don't make that much of a difference. A lot of fancy statistics are used to make it seem like they do, but they don't. Okay, so to wrap this up, just as a garden requires a healthy environment and terrain, a healthy brain <clears throat> requires positive experiences and optimized mitochondria function. The brain generates reality using a cognitive model of the world. It does not compute, which is developed into the best version of itself through one strategy, such as devoting attention to goals and the other strategies, excellent strategies mentioned in earlier talks, but this is the one I focused on. The brain's cognitive model is nourished and sustained by our mitochondria, which can be enhanced and restored using metabolic strategies such as fasting and keto diets. The mitochondria theory of Alzheimer's views mitochondria's function or weak terrain as the main problem, and this may be a more appropriate theory to treating this terrible disorder. And in the first randomized trial to examine a keto diet in people with just Alzheimer's, we found improvements in daily function quality of life. It's very promising, but we need more work. Thank you.